Yes. But yes, Jim, I don't know. Like, let's start with some pretty nice general questions. As in, what would you say is a list, the briefest of lists of fundamental flaws with the modern capitalist society? Like, if they were gonna, <laughs> if they were gonna work on something in Parliament tomorrow, so not not an axiomatic change, but if they were gonna work on something in Parliament tomorrow, what 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 would be a good start? Well, they should uh, realize that the capitalist system is like MS DOS. It's old. It's ancient. It's simple arithmetic. Okay, so to paraphrase Bill Clinton. It's the simple arithmetic, stupid. And we have a new world of uh, vectors, vector space. Right. Cybernetics has been hijacked by capitalism. And yes. in doing so, cybernetics involved in Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, all of the diagrammatic statistical mechanics that have been hijacked by capitalism wasn't the original intention of cybernetics. Cybernetics is the first country to adopt it was Chile. And it's interesting that it's now the 40th anniversary of the cybernetic revolution in Chile. Perhaps, Jim, you could like help us by uh, defining cybernetics, because I mean, okay. I have a certain image of what it is, which Networks would perhaps be influenced by people who purport it today as opposed to 40 years ago. Networks of diagrams. Can okay. You, you can understand diagrams. Yeah, like okay. feedback you can, loops. You can understand maps and feedback loops and uh, the, the, the quantum, you know what quantum mechanics is? Yeah, it's I have a reasonable idea. Vectors, vectors uh, X and Y and Z, and they end up pointing to a particular point where the where the information is clustered. That then links to another set of clusters and another set and another set. That is the geometry of information, correct? Yeah, it's actually very interesting what you said because uh, if today they have like a, a predominant learning, a pr predominant model for how people learn, it's called constructivism. And it pretty much functions just like networks. In a sense, to make meaning of something, you need yes. to have presence of it's related information in the network. Otherwise, okay. you can't quite work out the meaning of it. And right. So what, what Google did with documents was that they were able to pinpoint a document in universal cyberspace or cybernetic uh, networks. And that had a set of coordinates. Those set of coordinates were the words used inside the documents formed like like fence posts along the way to find out where that document resides. All of the documents close to it uh, were fed back to you when your search query used terms that were similar. Right. Years and years and years ago, uh, Claude Shannon, he was the IBM engineer who uh, designed the mathematics of information, the, the, the quantification of information. Particularly, he was able to take words and convert them to numbers. And when you can convert numbers, words to numbers, you can convert documents to numbers. When you can convert documents to numbers, you end up pinpointing it in cyberspace. What Google have done is that they have rented out that uh, cyberspace and they've made money on advertising. It is the claim of, it's the claim of cyberneticians that the network of documents or the network of decisions which allow you to make inference, intuition, the mathematics of intuition allows for a complete replacement of the very simple arithmetic used in banking. As we know, in banking, there's two vectors involved with price. I give you some money and that puts a vector of plus money in your bank. I use a minus vector, which takes money away from my bank. Now, with cybernetic, you end up with vectors going in every direction according to how many elements there are within the 
space of reasons. So you would basically, I... unlike you know the the present economic system where you factor in what's my investment and what's my gain, that same transaction in a cybernetic space would include other externalities: who else gains, who loses, what the environmental prices, and so on. Is is that kind of what you're inferring here, or? It does away with price. It does away with all the mechanisms of the current model. The current, when I say current, I'm talking about the current electricity model of finance. Right. And it replaces it with a static electricity model of information, where information is is uh, is held indefinitely. We have that on the internet. We know that the internet will forget things, but eventually. It forms a static relationship between the people that need a service, say pensioners and transport, between uh, people and health, between uh, what was that? Something just turned off. Okay, that camera turned off, but I've still got two other cameras going, so that's fine. Yeah, so that's what I would say to Parliament is that we need to address the language of committees, the language of law, the language of uh, the media, and we need to dismantle all of the constructs that have been hijacking us for the last 4,000 years or so, and replace it with something which is new and modern. And we know that this technology exists because Google is an example of that technology. Oh, per, I, I would say that, um, look, I, I am a novice when it comes to, say, cybernetics and in, in, in terms of its near-term future uh, uh, possibilities. But I can say that in many, many fields, the present economic system and its requirement for a profit out of everything generated um, has held back human progress in major way. Perhaps you may say medicine where they'll never develop a cure for any disease, especially if it's a really simple drug, because that will destroy profits, for example, of, of, of the cancer industry. I mean, let's say in uh, agriculture, where I'm, I, I'm an engineer, I do a little bit with robotics automation, and I could say confidently that there is easy feasibility for us to have, you know, 90% plus automated greenhouses, in every other man's backyard that produce pesticide, herbicide, GMO-free food that is, you know, so much healthier. Um, yes. it, I agree. And you could extrapolate that to, you know, why are planes still flying on the jet engines when the jet engines were developed in the 50s? You know, surely this military industrial complex that sucked up more money for their propulsion systems, probably tens of times more money for their propulsion systems than the IT industry, which brought us the internet and the information age and probably propelled our civilization 30, 40 years in front, ever did. Everything okay, Jim? Yes, I'm just looking up the name of the man who started the cybernetic revolution in Chile so that it can go out on your podcast so that people can look him up. His name was Anthony Stafford Beer, as in free as in beer. Okay. Okay, now during the administration of Salvador in Allende in Chile in the early 1970s, Beer was closely involved with a visionary project, CyberSyn, S-Y-N. This ah. took cybernetic um, theories into government. And obviously, we know what happened. The CIA... Pinochet a, kicked the end out with the help of the CIA, yep. Okay, so Stafford Beer was the unsung hero of the uh, of that revolution, and he died... So he was uh, a contemporary of Bucky Fuller, I presume, and uh, there were... He came out of the crew of mathematicians after the Second World War, who had to dismantle the rationing system right. and bring in profit. So if you understand that during the Second World War, there was no profit to be made on anything. Ah. Right. And this is I have no idea. So you're, you're saying that, say, the 
I mean, we all know that the arms manufacturers today make trillions of dollars on, yes. on the war. Then they did, everything Are was you telling me that at the Second World War that was not the case because of or what is the rationing system and how? Well, it didn't have profit involved in it. So you're it saying that the manufacturers... Price, price wasn't involved. So they, like, let's say, I don't know, I am Northrop Grumman or I make tanks. Yeah, well, you were commandeered. <laughs> you were commandeered. They gave you yeah. the resources and yes. you made tanks and that's it. Yeah. That's it. And then after the Second World War, they had to gradually bring in price and profit. And this is where the, 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 the small denomination coins were very important. Some of the history, I like your uh, obsolescence program, by the way, because it taught me a fair bit of stuff I didn't know about, about lamp bulbs and stuff. Ah. After the Second World War, the small uh, halfpenny and farthing was used in England to uh, look for theft at cash registers because if everything was rounded up to the like uh, 99 cents that one penny that was given in change uh, was an indication as to how many sales were made oh. and the accountants would count up the pennies and they would look after the pounds interesting yeah it was so if you look into greg beer you'll find out uh, or staff anthony stafford beer was his name but anyway let's go on from there ask some more questions and okay so i mean we're we have this idea here that a technology is running into more and more situations where it it, it gets hindered because it isn't in a situation where it can make profit uh, we said you know, uh, the, the pharmaceutical system, the agri business, for example. Now, keeping in mind what cybernetics is, would that change the image of, say, how we manage governments, local governments, companies, households? You know, if you record and capture all this information and relate it to other information in order to make optimal decisions, would would this notion of a, I don't know, a company employing 10,000 people be viable, a parliament, a, a council? What yes, implica the answer is yes. There are other measures other than the bottom line of a balance sheet that can be used in a, in a, uh, in a rationing system based on a network of decisions. We're not talking about decisions in isolation. We're talking about decisions like IP numbers. We're talking about being able to link through a network of decisions. First of all, a network of decisions that identify an individual is a is a, like a, a token ring loop. It's like a network of information that the head points to the tail and the tail points to the head. A break in that loop of information cancels the identity of that individual. So, Consequently, if you have a ring, if you have a ring of um, of networks that identify an individual, then he needs to make a, a purchase of health for health services. Yeah. Then there's another. Then there is another loop of information that joins onto that, and finally you get a chain of information. Those chains of information can in fact describe and, and, and validate a transaction. And they can remove the need for a, the, the trite definition of a medium of exchange because the network of information is becomes the exchange. No, that, that, that actually like, to be honest, Jim, I would say that that makes sense to me, but I'm an engineer with some experience in networks and feedback loops. The yes. question is, I guess there's two big questions. One, somebody will be writing uh, the, 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 this program, which is the infrastructure for databases. And it's companies like Google today who are, you know, pretty much part of the military industrial complex, U.S. imperialists uh, uh, agenda. Um, so first of all, can it be co-opted by the people that would create it? Secondly, even if it wasn't, um, say, co-opted for nefarious purposes, 
how do you account, like, if a human being is a data set and yes. it has certain needs, yes. I mean, how do you account for human nature? For, for instance, okay, myself and Sally need a similar profile of, say, vitamins, minerals, and nutrients, but yes. I'd like to get a steak and, and she would like to get some lentils. Yes. You know, there, there are uh, for individual preferences, Yes. Uh, cultural preferences, unpredictable things about humans, whereas when you're picturing them as a data set in some network, they may not translate. That's one question. And the other one is, who builds the infrastructure and can it be co-opted, corrupted very easily? Okay, the, the major competition that I see in this field is something called the Delphi Technique. Have you heard of the Delphi technique? I have heard of the Delphi technique. Um, it's, it, it, uh, it's a way of achieving consensus, consensus from a group of people that by no forcing. That's what they did in Agenda Twenty One. That's what they use by forcing your predetermined goal onto a group of people and making them think that uh, your predetermined outcome is what they want. That now, is very, very, very. Uh, that they've used that thing in, in have you heard of Agenda 21 in the Delphi yes. technique? Yes. And they use a similar thing in, in Occupy movement. Um, it yes. wasn't, it was to do with mic check derived from, um, from this CIA intelligence. Yes. Um, now, was, I have studied that and I, had, I know what the flaw is in it. And I know how to add something to cybernet to prevent that from happening. Interesting. And 30, 35 years ago, I saw inside a network of information an area that was a black hole to that information. And that if you add new uh, rows and columns to be digested by that uh, grid, if something was not significant, to the existing grid, it would fall into the black hole and be sucked away. Okay. Therefore, therefore to uh, apply consensus to mathematical decision making, you need to be able to filter out the what's called the outliers, which are which is information that is not pertinent. But in order to prevent the Delphi technique from commandeering the frame of information that is used to decide, you must allow every individual to add rows and columns to a particular cluster of information to see if their contribution is going to slip away into the black hole or stick onto the, uh, into the middle and thus change, change the, the, the quantum uh, force that is attracting that network to other like-minded clusters. Okay, so I have developed that process to to a fine art. So how would you like? How how do you intend to, uh, 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 in a sense, get that process out there? You know, is it a software program? Is it a, a, a like a a twenty-page manual on how to run uh, discussions, workshops, debates? And I mean, how? How would you out? Do you have some type of a, a little project that yes, is this alternative? I have, I have a project that I've been involved <laughs> for 35 years, and this I took it over when it was already uh, finished at one level, and it had already been uh, developing for 40 years. So we're talking about a 70-year project that started at the during the Second World War. When you had those big rooms and they were pushing around things on on uh, on boards, yeah, and they were, yeah, the mainframes. No, 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 no. They, this is how they, they they had they had girls with sticks and they would be pushing uh, battle uh, formations and and battleships onto big tables. Well, okay. those people those people in the back room were calculating the arithmetic of the influences of these uh, vectors. And they were able to come up with uh, the psychology of, of the German civilian 
what he would do when he was saturated with bombs. And the, all this information was worked out before they started the air raids. Really? And to what level were they accurate? Well, they won the, uh, they won, the, they won. <laughs> I mean, sure, but by the time the Allies were bombing the Germans, the war was for all intents and purposes yes, the over. the Germans didn't use the same technique on, on the British, and they lost. It was the technique of saturation bombing that allowed the, the, uh, the Germans to lose and the British to win. However, that's beside the point. The mechanics, the mechanics of statistics that were developed by uh, Charles Spearman, he was the godfather of statistics. And in, in the First World War, he came up with the technique called factor analysis. Now, factor analysis says, okay, we've got some information over here. We're, let's see if we can test that to see whether it, it uh, applies to these factors. So they have to come up with the factors, and then they see if the data fits the factors. Yep. The protege of uh, Charles Spearman was a guy named Dr. Patrick Slater, who in his later life developed the, the mathematics called principal component analysis where you take the data and you see what is inside the data. And that could be data from a person's mind or data from a marketing survey or data from uh, a document uh, word list. And he was very successful and he created this program called Ingrid, which allowed Did his- Did he call it Ingrid? Yes, he called, the Ingrid was a subroutine inside of his major work, which was the, the grid analysis package, which included consensus analysis, difference analysis, and the Ingrid analysis, where you put yourself in a grid, in grid. Ah, I thought he had like a Swedish wife or a daughter and hence no, 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 Ingrid. He had a Dachshund, he had an old Dachshund who he froze to death, uh, dragging him along the sidewalks deep in the snow and the poor dog died. Oh, anyway. you, know what, you know what seems very fascinating to me, Jim? It seems like people figured out all of these techniques of information analysis way before the computing power caught up sometime, you know, in, in, in well, probably did, yeah. the 90s. Yes. Now, what's happened with capitalism? Don't forget, this is where it's problematic. Capitalism reduced everything down to one dimension. A single dimension from line land, right? Bottom line, line yeah. land. You know, you, you know, flatlanders. Yeah, the, line, yeah. was, the line landers, the accountants, brought everything down to a, a, a one dimensional set of numbers. Then, in order to decide whether there was a risk involved, they had to use gambling mathematics, the mathematics behind roulette in order to break that one dimension back out to see if they could simulate what the real world was uh, doing. And they never got it right, but they got some of it right. Yeah. But now they, what they've ended up with is machines that are basically bleeding the world like a, like a one-armed bandit. Well, I mean, to be honest, you know, uh, this financial system thing has been something that I've been following, you know, intently since I'd say two, late 2007. And in, 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 I've watched a lot of, say, conspiracy related documentary stuff before, and I believed none of it until I saw ones about the monetary system. And at the, at, when you scratch under the surface, when you pick up any of the literature written by central banks, you realize that money's created from debt from debt and mathematically debt is growing at a higher exponential than money which means that you are going to go completely totally and utterly bankrupt with 100 percent probability yes you know given sufficient time yeah now and what you do see in the world today is People that have that are the kings, the beneficiaries of the system, the ones that hold it, are actually struggling to keep it alive within the parameters that they have created. Once people realize that anybody who is spending money is devaluing 
somebody else's cash. In other words, you go out and you spend uh, half a million dollars on a one-bedroom apartment. You have just, uh, you've just devalued the economy by half a million dollars. And that has caused my groceries to go uh, up in price. That's absolutely true. I mean, so, given, given well, the, the, the mere no, assumption that the person receiving the money deposited in the bank, which is going to happen 100% of the time, nearly, that's pretty much exactly what happens. Right. So don't need to attack the bankers. You attack people selling houses because they're the ones who are robbing from you. But look, they have needs. They're human beings who need a place to live. Right. Now, I can take all of those needs. For example, at the moment, we have an auction system. We have the highest price wins the house, whether that person is, uh, it doesn't matter where they are from, what they want to do with the house. You've heard of LIBOR, the LIBOR scandal? Yes, I have. Okay, you know how that worked? They, they, they had the bids of, of for the day, they knocked off the top and the bottom, and then yep. they took the average? Well, I don't see why the price of a house cannot be worked out that same way. Then you have the final people are then judged on their reasons why, and the winner gets to pay that middle price. And that would then burst the bubble, that would bring down the property values all over the world. That, no, that, that is a genius, you know, like that system is a hundred times more fair. Therefore, but, would, if, if, there's, if, the, if the group of people decide that it should not be a Chinese uh, resident from Hong Kong who is buying a property in Melbourne, he is excluded from that, or he gets a very bad mark. Yeah, he may not. He may not be the person who wins the house. Yeah, the. But then, if everybody knew that there was always going to be a medium price that was set because of the system, wouldn't they, people then they, just offset it by making ridiculously large? Well, this bits. is what happened with LIBOR. This is what happened with LIBOR. Well, I'm. What I'm saying is, if all information was gathered, we would not need to have anything priced at all. That's everything absolutely be, true. Everything but I mean, be you can't, it's still a huge assumption, like if all information was gathered, you know, if, if in capitalism, everybody had perfect information, right, then nobody could rip anyone off because that but information you know that asymmetry doesn't, doesn't exist. You no, know that doesn't happen. Capitalism only exists on secrecy. Secrecy yeah. involved in patents, secrecy involved in trademarks, secrecy of copyright secrecy between the lawyers and the bankers. Mm. Capitalism only talks to other forms of capitalism using something called price. Yep. Right? I'm saying let's get rid of price and let's attach all the information. And I, we can keep but we can keep big corporations in business. Mm. I because, agree with that. I mean I agree that that would work once the A infrastructure for the information was there and once, you know, you consistently built up uh, uh, to such a level where, you know, everybody has access to everything and we can perfectly calculate things. But in in the meantime, given that humans are humans... That... No, there is such thing as human nature. There is, there is nature, there is, there is a nature of a group of people, but there is no human nature. I, I, that, that's a very interesting point. See, I would agree to you, with you to an extent, say that human nature is an aggregate sum of uh, learned behaviors while the person is growing up in a particular society. Or being, or being dumbfounded by uh, the, 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 the liars. There's only one lie in the entire world. Everything comes from that one lie. One line? You're talking about bloodline or... No, no, no. One lie as opposed lie. to truth. There is one lie in this world. What is it? <laughs> it's for you to find out. You type in <laughs> a computer, one lie, yep. and you will find studies on who is perpetrating the one lie. That one lie permeates all governments, permeates all religions, permeates all, uh, all the structures that... that that force people into the simple arithmetic. Anyway, let's get on to another topic. That's like uh... on, on... <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think that you know we could go on a small, uh, you know, on, on a small tangent and say that 
from what exists, I mean today, available to us through the internet, right? Yeah. How can people like me, like our viewers, uh, leverage the power of cybernetics to make better decisions in their life? You know, is is there something? Is there a practical value to the average person as opposed to like a, an institution, a government, a company, etc.? Yes, there is. Uh, the technique is. Uh... You, have you heard of uh, in theater? There's a, there's something called the repertory theater. I haven't. You haven't heard of it. It's the old Shakespearean uh, actor. He would have a repertoire of tricks that he would do in his acting, and that was boiled down to something called a repertory. Repertory theater was where you get out there and you do your whole show. You you explain everything about your your technique. And the repertory grid technique. So that's repertory. R E P T repertory. R E repertory. P R T R. R E P T or O T. Yeah, something like that. The repertory grid technique came out of a theory of psychology, which explained that people will react to events based on their previous reaction to the same events. Sort of similar. Yeah. Yeah. And that theory was called the construct theory of the psychology or personal construct psychology. And it came out of um, a man by the name of George Kelly. He was a professor at Brandeis University and he designed this uh, theory of psychology. Patrick Slater, who was also a, uh, a professor emeritus of, uh, he was a statistician at London University. He developed the mathematics of personal construct psychology. And the two things came together in a computer program called Ingrid, which I acquired, I acquired the copyright to Ingrid in the late 70s. Wow. And it was like a crystal ball. You could you could feed anything into it, and it would give you a a glimpse of where you should go. So, you have I mean you basically have a copy of this Ingrid program on your computer, I presume. Yes. <laughs> and um... it has it has it is it has been written in seven different languages. It has uh, got old and tired, but I keep it alive. I keep reworking it. And I do this on a basis that if it's going to survive, it's going to survive in the mind of one programmer. Cool. Um, and so how I keep it alive is I keep adding a studio. I build a studio on the outside of it. And that studio is also called Ingrid. So Ingrid is, is something which is growing in word and in, in, uh, in capability. Currently, it plays chess, it plays roulette, it plays uh, music, it does uh, fast Fourier analysis on, on my 25,000 MP3 tracks. And it plays them, and it mixes them, and it finds the intros and outros of the musical tracks. And it's playing this music wow. while it's also reading from all the various news sites around the world. So you've basically implemented some level of artificial intelligence into Ingrid. Uh, if, if it reads the news and mixes your music, I mean, clearly, that's an automated process. Yes, exactly. I also realize that it's a mirror of how the brain works. It's a direct analogy to the firing of synapses in the, in the brain. But just to give you an idea of where I get my news from, I currently scour slash dot dissident voice, the physics org dot com. Uh, physics dot org, yeah. Well, I, I, TV I, I, news, intrepid report, profiles in evil, rusty skewed news, the anonymous news, incog man, global research, Canada. Free that's an excellent website. Global Research um, CA, yeah, that's excellent. Credo, Documentary Storm, American Free Press, J.B. Campbell, John Kaminsky, 
what really happened, Zero Hedge, Alternet, The Raw Story, Activist Post, and reviews from Tom's Hardware. And <laughs> these, these come in as RSS feeds, and they show up on the left-hand side of my uh, Firefox. I select uh, certain stories. My Ingrid program then takes those web pages finds out the major text which is inside the page, finds out whether I've read it before, and then if it hasn't been read by me before, it then puts it in a queue, and eventually I will read it. But in the background of all this, I'm working my way through the uh, anarchist library, 2,000 full-length uh, articles. I'm up to article 500 and um, I'm up to one called the cybernetic. It cyber doesn't go out much. The cybernetic hypothesis. Right. No, I'm getting out. I'm getting out. I've got a radio station called the Meadowbank Takeaway Auto Radio. Cool. And it, it broadcasts for me far enough so I can go walking for several miles and listen to re FM radio on my Android phone. Uh, I'm currently working on a method of uh, sending 16K blocks of text uh, through Gmail to my phone, which will automatically answer it and automatically go text to speech. So I'm hearing on the, on, while, I'm, while I'm anywhere on, on 3G, I can listen to what my computer at home is reading. Jim, I got to congratulate you. I mean, you know, there's not many people. I imagine you're 50 something or a bit more, but there's not many people of your generation that are literally not on top, not familiar with, but actually using, personalizing, and exploiting like the cutting edge technologies of today from. They know, all got fired. Sorry? Lost their jobs. All the people like me. We're, we're laid off through obsolescence, right? Our languages were destroyed. Our skills were destroyed to allow for new immigrants to come in and take the jobs. Most of these people of my generation ended up as gardeners. Jim, I find that, like, given your technical skills, I find, honestly, at least in your case, that hard to believe. Well, if you were... I given up my, my dream... I you had been, ethical issues. That's what took uh, you out of I, it. So. I, 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 have, I have a concept that can, in fact, replace the complete existing world structure. And because of that, because of that idea alone, which I have been able to prove to anybody who was cared to listen, uh, I have been invalidated from the system. So I was given an invalid's pension and sent packing. <laughs> And told to travel the world and uh, don't come back. <laughs> um, Jim, are you like in? I know you're in Canada, or New Zealand, or and a Trinidadian. Where? Trinidad. You're in. You're in. No, he was born there. Okay, you're a Trinidadian, and yes. presently you Which are. Which makes me by default a Trinidadian if I want to be. That's awesome. I gotta say that. <laughs> If yeah. I had like, yeah, man. <laughs> if I could be reborn, I'd probably pick some Caribbean island for sure, yeah. and that cool, cool. English accent. <laughs> cool. Um, hey, Dad, give him a give the camera a bit of a, like a or give the laptop a tour of the um your place and show the Ingrid screen. You know the homepage screen that's got all of the vectors and information on it. Well, I tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll transfer the call seamlessly across to my Android. Okay, you know, so it's, it's much like the, uh, I, uh, have you heard of 3D printers? Yes, yes. I have one. I mean, me and my housemate, we built one. And the fantastic Excellent. thing about the design is that all the parts are standard. Like, from the hot plates of the stepper motors... They're all in standard sizes that are made by multiple manufacturers. So if anything goes wrong, not only can you repair them cheaply, but you could get the same part from multiple manufacturers in different countries. And I think that should be the industry standard. Of course. Well, that's called open source. 
Yep. Here we go. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Record this again. Are you recording again? Yeah, yeah I am recording. Okay, okay. I'm started. I think uh, this will be your. So this will be your okay. those, those are those are my uh, motorcycle helmets up there. Cool. And and bicycle helmet. And and here is the uh, here is the mountain bike. I don't know whether you can see it. Yeah. That'll be cool. It's a little bit dark because yeah. dark and to eventually come by visit you and then I can look into you in person. And then I can like read it. This, this one is rather interesting. Uh, this, this is a story. This is Google this is a, this Clinton. Is a, this is, this I is like another... if you show that you're gonna tell the whole story about it, which will take I mean it's interesting. Well, no, that, it's could be, that could be another that could be another time. <laughs> okay. Google like right, and here's, and here's where I do my exercising in the morning. Cool. And this is the this is the uh, the bathroom and the shower, and this is where it's my uh, like Ingrid blasting kind of like information through. You wake up in that house. Like I was staying there, and I woke up in the morning with Ingrid pumping information into my like, <laughs> brain while I was in like sleep mode. Uh, Okay, well, I'm going to turn Ingrid on because Ingrid is uh, primarily a a way of keeping it alive, keeping alive this uh, this code. Because any time you want to analyze information, it's called a code. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so and you're a little are... bit closer to you. You're on the what left? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's good. That's we'll good. Yeah. Okay. So Ingrid is starting here. I just think show the home page is interesting as a, an artwork even. Okay. I'm going to show you the actual graphics. So what we've got is a, is a, uh, a bunch of little screens that are coming up here. Hmm. So what it's doing here is it's reading out, it's just continuing to read the, um, the current, the current stuff that it wants me to listen to off the internet. And over here we're listening yeah. to Tori Amos. Hey dude. <laughs> Feedback. Thanks, Francesco. I don't know how that happened. I am. Uh, I'm getting parts from Element 14. I'm building a, a gadget in the, like Water the Garden automatically. It's kind of what I was talking about earlier. I was trying to tell Sunny about your internet farm idea. Okay. Because he's got a permaculture garden out there and aquaponics and things. Excellent. What's going to be in here is going to be like so tiny. But did you see how funny that was? Like when the third person looked too, we started getting feedback yeah. like out of nowhere. We're good now. <laughs> I might get some more water. You want some more water? Oh, you got water? Oh. Yeah, I got, got some. Maybe it's the door opening. Yeah, it could be. This, this is some graphics here. No. of what Ingrid does with uh, information from a grid. Uh -huh. And if you look at it, it will, it's, it's actually moving. Wow. So it's a five dimensional space. Each one of these vectors is uh, a, a different concept of an overall decision. So it's so very much like the matrix come alive. Like when you say five vectors, I mean what what? Okay, like I can visualize four D space. Yes, like this it, is five D space. I don't understand five D space. I, I just don't. Well, you understand three dimensions. Yes, I understand, understand fourth if it's time. This is five five dimensions is basically four dimensions printed over top of itself, as we see here. And it's turned into art. 
Wow. I'm just going to turn off the um, the reader. Okay, so I've just quit the reader and the music is continuing to play. And what we have here is, is, a, is a decision which is simply being rotated to music. Uh -huh. And it's using, a, uh, it's using photography backgrounds to fill in the triangles. Wow. And every every few seconds, every every few minutes or so, it will change. So there's no um, there's and, no. I mean, although the purpose of that thing is just basically for your entertainment. For my entertainment, to, for the art, to actually also keep alive the software that's deep down behind it. Right. So that I can transfer that, say, from uh, the the Microsoft into the Android phone, and then eventually I want to transfer that software into a, uh, a connection into my brain ah so you're i mean you'd say that you're supporting the whole transhumanist idea about downloading your consciousness onto a computer with with a couple of major uh, objections and the major objection is that i won't do it while capitalism is in existence so you you are you familiar with ray kurzweil Yes, very much so, but I do not like him, I don't like his philosophy, I do not, and I, I don't do like what he stands for. I don't like the fact that Ray Kurzweil wants to say that everything should be owned. I agree with you. I, um, I spent a fair bit of my time looking into him, and I, I, I don't... Um, his, no, his whole notion is, is that... That Ingrid looks really good. You know, compared to other Ingrids, it it well, it's, it's kind it's of fear-based. Very... Everything is owned, and I am just I I don't agree with you either, Jim. When it comes to a human being being a data set, but I just think Ray Kurzweil is very very much uh, a symbiotic saying, part of this. Saying that 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 music a musical score is not a data set. Are you saying that a neuron is not a data set? Well, here's the thing. That that's a very interesting uh, point. Well, okay. Um, everything is everything we have, right, is made out of uh, atoms and molecules. And if they were as cause and effect simple as Lego blocks, you know, if they were entirely materialistic, if you pushed one a certain amount and you could predict exactly what it would do, then everything built from that material wouldn't get any extra properties. So yeah, we would be a data set. But with some no, understanding no. of quantum physics, which You're shows wrong. that that even even electrons have some level of consciousness, no, us being you're wrong. made of <laughs> how many they times don't do finish, I finish at least? Sorry. What? <laughs> Sally was saying I didn't finish. I mean, I'm saying that you know we are more than the sum of our parts, and if if well, you can no. make a copy, the, the, the people. The people who think that an electron has a consciousness are the people who think that the neuron is attached to some cosmic uh, medium through which consciousness is is uh, is connecting everybody to everything else. Now well, those no, are the no, people. No, no, doesn't one doesn't necessarily follow from the other. Uh, and but, but they are not, people. They are people. It's not Hang my on, opinion. Let's, let's not finished. Okay. They are the people who they are the people who believe in an immortal soul. And I do not believe in an immortal soul. I say the only life we have is the one we've got now. And the neuron is only producing numbers. The numbers being the firing rates of the synapses. However, that is manifested through a PC, through an Android phone, through a neuron in the brain. It is simply processing information. Yes. yes. And Again. once you can replicate, when you can replicate the, the information processes, you don't need the original computer anymore. Ingrid was working like this on a CDC 7700 from Control Data Corporation back in the 60s. Except 
it only produced numbers on sheets of paper and, and people had to uh, visualize these patterns. Right. But now we've got computers that actually show you the patterns. Yes. That looks amazing. Are you recording that, Ingrid? That's the uh, nicest no, looking Ingrid I'm I've not, seen. But you can download Ingrid. Any, it's it's no, open but that source. Particular, whatever it's vectoring to at the moment, whatever information is causing it to create that image, you should save that one because that's a work of art. Well, all my music that's playing in the background is the, the uh, it's also a work of art. Well, just record that playlist because that one is actually not bad. Well, from a visual perspective, at least. The way the world is moving is that the things that we create are only shared with a very small number of people in a local community. We were talking we about local to, communities earlier. We don't. We don't need. We don't need to have uh, mega corporations anymore. We don't need leaders anymore. I agree. Take us to war. I agree. Um, Jim, now, do you want to have a look behind that to see what the numbers were that produced these diagrams? Why not? Why not? Let's okay. have a look. Okay, let's let's bring up the numbers. Okay, and there's the, the uh, there are the numbers here. And it's uh, I don't know whether you can see it, but it's Sally Leg, made in the January the twenty second, nineteen eighty seven. Are you still going off my? Freaking school assessment. Nice. Do you know why? From you know why I do that? <laughs> I do that because the whenever Ingrid solves an equation, I need to check the results because I'm tampering with the software all the time, and I need to be able to make sure that the data. It's my test uh, matrix. Okay. And I made it, I've buried inside of Ingrid. The, the results of the equation so that it, it finds an answer that has been produced by a change in software, which is different from the energy of the original red, then I know that the, uh, the, the, there is a problem in the code. But these numbers here, they represent Sally's feelings towards her school subjects. Uh, you certainly would appreciate this being a teacher, maybe. I yeah. don't know. I don't know anybody. I don't even appreciate this. Okay, your that was feelings. So, long ago. <laughs> so, what were her feelings, Jim? I'm interested. Okay, well then, she said she said she needed to learn more about English, but she didn't need to learn much more. About she needed to learn more about cooking, but she didn't need to learn more about art. She said there was lots of copying to do in in. That doesn't uh, in make cook. sense because art is the thing that I'm really interested in. So maybe really yep. that number represents whether I felt proficient enough in myself and my abilities to actually do the what do the art. But that's what really, you, that that's, that graph doesn't represent the fact that there's always more to learn. No, but you 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 weren't struggling with art, but it meant. Well, that should be phrased that way then, I get. Well, not necessarily struggling, but like more support. Or I needed to grow. Okay, for example, grow. lots of copying to do in music. In music, you said there was lots of copying. You had to write things out by hand in music. Uh, your teacher, your teacher did not explain art very well. Um, you thought the classical studies were boring, but you thought art was not boring. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the ability to break down a complex set of thoughts. For example, the complexity of uh, 14 different school subjects in the mind of a, a Form 1, a 12-year-old, explained by uh, vectors of numbers that go from high to low across each one of these is a differential equation. And if you know about the mathematics of uh, principal component analysis, you will know that when that when that matrix is solved, you end up with um, you end up with this sort of um, you end up with these sorts of equations which are capable of being rotated and overlaid with using uh, photographs. To fill in triangles, and it spins around and creates uh, mystical art. <laughs> cool. 
I gotta say, There's like, you know, this is... This is really, really, really enchanting, Jim. I'm yet to see, like, some, <laughs> you know, massive practical application that I can plug plug in and 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 and, and, and do stuff with tomorrow banks. but replacing I, I, government replacing banks replacing the law maybe that's what my neurons look like when they grow inside my brain yeah no 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 i jim the the long term applications sorry the long range ones i mean with with a lot of you know data entry programming and optimization are really you know the entire economic system what else and, and also also, the entire documentary system of um, of Google. Yeah. To, to what extent is Google already like um, like Ingrid? Well, uh, I published Ingrid in 1996. In Jan in January of 96, it was given back to the University of London as an open source, public domain software. I know that Google got a hold of it. The Google page rank algorithm is based on Ingrid. So and the, the, page, the page rank algorithm of Google is not ranking pages. It's based on the name of Larry Page. So he created a thesis. Uh, and inside of Larry Page's thesis for Google is all the mathematics of Ingrid. Dad, so, put yourself back on. Like, let's talk to you again. So you're okay. saying basically that um, Sergey Brin and uh, what's the other guy's name? Larry Page. Larry Page essentially picked up Ingrid, um, modified the, the source code, and made Google. They would have looked at anything that they could have found at the time when they were producing. Um, Google and I know that Ingrid was available and I know it was picked up by the uh, all the universities around the world. Had to have a repository uh, for this source code because it was a very unique uh, and it was the first of its kind to to mathematically picture a person's thoughts. Wow! And wow. track them over time. And, and find out whether introduced therapies would help that person come to grips with their problem. You know, what you're saying is really interesting because Google has made claims in the past about being able to predict yeah. social movements. Um, yes, and it's already affecting the economy. For example, uh, my bike out the front there, I had a leaky fork and I took it to the mechanic and he says, oh, that's $300, I've got to replace the seals. Uh, you got no other choice. I come back to Google and I, I search on the, uh, the the fork problem, and I find out how to take a a small film negative. You know, from the days when you used to have 35 mil film, yeah, and you get in the Photoshop, and they would give you your prints, and then it would also give you the little um, negatives. Negative. Well, I can take some negatives and stuff them down my forks and clean out the gunk and add some. Uh, Judy butter grease into the fork and it can rejuvenate my seals. I saved myself $300. I took it down to uh, to the mechanic and I, he didn't even know you could do this. Wow. So open sourcing of information is saving people um, lots of money. Absolutely. I mean, in my life, I uh, in 2007, I, I was on, on the uh, acquisition end. We were basically buying control systems um, for macerators on offshore oil rigs and for something that was as simple as uh, reading the current draw and reversing blades when the current draw got above a threshold um, we paid six thousand dollars and today I could I have a microcontroller right there that cost me 20 bucks that could do the same job and we're talking six years yeah from six thousand to like twenty bucks, it's insane. Okay, and these these are uh, all to do with physics. Physics is what's driving the uh, the singularity. The, the 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 technologies that we are developing now for nanotechnology. We cannot say that capitalism is reducing the price. The price is being forced down because we're making things smaller 
and we're making them run cheaper and they're not using up as much electricity and we can get robots to recreate them. So oh, I'm, all for, I'm all for uh, getting rid of this dead hunk of uh, cancerous flesh that I call me and replacing me with a prosthetic brain. And that prosthetic brain I'm going to write the code for. But I wow. refuse to do it while there's Sally, how people... would you feel about your dad in, in a robot? I've grown up with this. <laughs> <laughs> Is that about how going to find a, a, uh, Sally's going to find in her old age uh, an incubator clone parent. Okay. And I'm going to clone okay. myself in the year 2080. Okay. Thereabouts. Okay. Perhaps. 50 Perhaps. years after I've been in a, been a brain in a bottle, I'll yeah. keep my DNA yeah. and I'll, I'll clone it. And then we'll start backtracking culture. Because you know where we've come from uh, as human beings. We're actually now the basic theory of Darwin evolution has been turned on its head in the last few months. Yeah, Darwinian evolution yeah. said that we evolved gradually along branches of a tree of species. But they have shown that we can crossbreed species. And it's now very much in my mind uh, I've accepted the fact that the human being has, has crossbred itself many times in the past between apes, chimpanzees, and monkeys, and pigs. Chimpanzee and pig has produced a very interesting harmony of 48 genes from the chimpanzee and 36 genes in the pig has produced a 46 gene human. Wow, I, I I don't know. I'll have to look into that. That's but three quarter uh, time beat. That's a that's a three fourth beat. I think, I think Jim, you have a point to the extent that, you know, a lot of people over the last twenty years have have pointed out unsurmountable problems with Darwinian evolution. Now I'm not really going to vote on whether it was. Uh, you know, a period of massive mutation on planet Earth due to some solar wave or aliens came down or we got crossbred with, with pigs, but the, something, something very different from what the textbooks say is definitely the answer on that one. Um, Eugene McCarthy is the name of the, uh, the world leading expert on hybridization. And he's written this thesis. Eugene McCarthy, oh. uh, he's, he's, he goes into a 400 page uh, thesis on, on, uh, on hybridization. Why he doesn't mention chimpanzees and pigs and humans at all, but brings up all the evidence from both history and he is a world leading geneticist. And he is, the, he is the leading expert on hybrids. And what he says is that when you create a cross between chimpanzee and pig or between salamander and, and fruit fly or whatever, the offspring will be infertile, but sometimes the female is fertile. The male is never fertile. But mm -hmm. back crossing, back crossing the female hybrid back with the original male will produce eventually fertile males. And then and you have you everything you need. You, marijuana, you know the story of the male and the female and the seed and whatever. No, male and female of the marijuana plant, what about it? Well, the well, female. You have, to, you have to kill the male. Yes, because the female has if all you THC. Kill, you, 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 you actually cause a strain on the, uh, on the offspring. Uh -huh. Anyway. Interesting. Well, so do you want to cover any other topics? I, I, um, I think we've we've gone far enough. We, Sally and I, were going to go to this uh, exhibition. Sensorium exhibition as part of the Melbourne Fringe Festival. Oh, very good. Very it's good. like a big snoozling room, like a multi-sensory okay. environment. Some of these. Both of these videos are top on things. You Jim. still didn't show the um the homepage for Ingrid with the Echis unincorporated picture. Homepage for Ingrid. 
You mean this one? Yeah, that one. Explain okay. that, like. <laughs> I made this. I made this in 1998. Oh, it's a bit and shaky. It, we can't really hold see it. Hold it still, Jim, if you can. Oh yeah, better. I made this from news photographs, which I put over top of each other and uh, used blur and luminescence and multiplication of the pixels to create a uh, piece of concept art. And behind each But it works, space, like you can click on things, yeah? Yeah, you're, you're hyper there is... Awesome. Each, there's, there's over 200 hyperlinks. And I know where each one of them goes to. Right? That's your portal it, into the internet. It's it's my it's my portal, and there are throats through these four hundred pictures, which include We're links to everywhere on the internet. And it's based on religion and money and 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 uh, all. The, I mean, you can even see the New York Tower is coming down if you look closely. Wow. It was and just a uh, concept. Does the shift? Does the picture shift with time or not? During the time I was making it, I would be adding photographs to it every day. But I have stopped adding them. But during the time it was being made, yes, it was changing. Okay. What if you made like one a year, like a, a, yeah, a thing like of a, a year? Of, I guess yeah. you'd always have some that were constant. Anyway, deviation. Okay. But uh, in terms of the internet that I started reading in 1994, I went on to the internet in 94, and I traveled to Vancouver to interview William Gibson, who was the uh, father of cyberspace. He wrote all those cyberpunk novels. Wow. He won the uh, the Hugo Nebula Award for science fiction in '84 with his book called Neuromancer. Interesting. I know and, the uh, uh, it is the biggest award in in sci-fi. I mean, I know like June right. got it in a couple of. Well, I started reading the internet page by page, and I have I haven't reached 10 million yet, but I've well over five million pages I have read on every subject. Wow. And the biggest grouping that has been pleasure to me is health. I have cured myself of problems. I have cured my motorcycle of problems. I've cured my car. I've, I've learned to cook. I can do everything based on the information that I have received Fantastic. as a gift on the Internet to me. And consequently, I give back my gift. I will be checking out uh, Ingrid, that's for sure. Okay. If you can send it's, me it's like a cool. download link. Yes, the, the, just type in Ingrid and my name, Jim Leg and Ingrid, and you will find it. But let me advise you that it is more complex than the most complex avid editing system that you would find on the internet. And I would have to help you install it. Okay. Because it takes okay. it takes weeks and weeks of effort to, um, to 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 make it work properly. When I say work properly, it has to learn your music because your music is the key to uh, your enjoyment of it. You're right. And it takes a, on my case uh, twenty five thousand tracks. It's there's three weeks of number crunching to calculate the uh, the signature of each song. But who wants to go out to Amazon and to the cloud and tell them that you've got this particular track from uh, whoever and, and them giving you the beats per minute and the signature key? What you're doing is you're telling Hollywood that you've got all this music. Well, who wants that? Mm. The cloud, the cloud is, a, is, a, is a scam. Yeah, I, I don't it's, like it either. Right. So we need to have everything on your local computer the intelligence needs to be local distributed that's absolutely right because anyone can shut the cloud down at any minute well they've done that before like but i would i would willingly help you install ingrid 
And there are lots of ancillary programs that Ingrid uses. For example, to read, it needs a program with uh, the, 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 uh, the SAPI 5 capability. I use a program called Text Aloud. But if you're a pirate, you need to know exactly what version of Text Aloud to get wow. in because wow. otherwise. I'll tell you what, Jim, I, you know. At, at this point in time, my schedule is, uh, for the next month, ridiculous. Uh, but I do intend to come to New Zealand probably in January. So if I do, I'll bring my laptop and we could do this in person. And I'm going to do some reading up on cybernetics so I can ask you some more intelligent questions. Yeah. And possibly, you know, we could have like a live uh, display of Ingrid, perhaps get it to make some predictions and some interpretations. Yeah. Sally, I'm going to go to David on the on his birthday, which is the 9th of October. And then I'm going free tenting right up to the top of the island uh, on my bike for, for several days. And I'll be, uh, be back here. Uh, several weeks after that. Cool. I'm not going to be a freegan, but I'm going to be free tenting and just living, living in the forest. Nice. Hmm. And it's going to be warm. Cool. cool. And I'll have everything I need. I'll have all my uh, tools and tent and sleeping bag and just camping in the, in, in wherever I stop for the night. I've got stoves. I got two up, two stoves. I got all my gear. Hmm. Oh well, I should be back at the uh, beginning of November, end of October. Okay, well, I should be back in town by then. Nice. All right, Jim. I think we're gonna call it a day here. Call it a day here. It was, it was pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the time you made today. No worries. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Beer, you'll find out. Uh, or staff, Anthony Stafford Beer was his name. But anyway, let's go on from there. Ask some more questions. And okay, so I mean, we're we have this idea here that a technology is running into more and more situations where it it, it gets hindered because it isn't in a situation where it can make profit. Uh, we said. You know uh, uh, the the pharmaceutical system, the agri business, for example. Now, keeping in mind what cybernetics is, would that change the image of, say, how we manage governments, local governments, companies, households? You know, if you record and capture all this information and relate it to other information in order to make optimal decisions, would would this notion of a, I don't know, a company employing 10,000 people be viable, a parliament, a, a council? What yes. implica the answer is yes. There are other measures other than the bottom line of a balance sheet that can be used in a, in a, uh, in a rationing system based on a network of decisions. We're not talking about decisions in isolation. We're talking about decisions like IP numbers. We're talking about being able to link through a network of decisions. First of all, a network of decisions that identify an individual is, a, is a, like a, a token ring loop. It's like a network of information that the head points to the tail and the tail points to the head. A break in that loop of information cancels the identity of that individual. So, if you have a ring, if you have a ring of um, of networks that identify an individual, then he needs to make a, a purchase of health for health services. Yeah. Then there's another. Then there is another loop of information that joins onto that, and finally you get a chain of information. Those chains of information can in fact describe and, and, and validate a transaction. And they can remove the need for a, the, the trite definition of a medium of exchange because the network of information is, becomes the exchange. No, that, that, that actually like, 
to be honest, Jim, I would say that that makes sense to me, but I'm an engineer with some experience in networks and feedback loops. The yes. question is, yes, but yes, Jim, I don't know. Like, let's start with some pretty nice general questions as in what would you say is a list, the briefest of lists of fundamental flaws with the modern capitalist society? Like if they were gonna, <laughs> if they were gonna work on something in parliament tomorrow, so not, not an axiomatic change, but if they were gonna work on something in parliament tomorrow, what, what, what would be a good start? Well, they should uh, realize that the capitalist system is like MS-DOS. It's old, it's ancient, it's simple arithmetic. Okay, so to paraphrase Bill Clinton, it's the simple arithmetic, stupid. And we have a new world of uh, vectors, vector space. Right. Cybernetics has been hijacked by capitalism. And yes. in doing so, cybernetics involved in Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, all of the diagrammatic statistical mechanics that have been hijacked by capitalism wasn't the original intention of cybernetics. Cybernetics is the first country to adopt it was Chile. And it's interesting that it's now the 40th anniversary of the cybernetic revolution in Chile. Perhaps, Jim, you could like help us by uh, defining cybernetics, because I mean, okay. I have a certain image of what it is, Networks which would perhaps be influenced by people who purport it today as opposed to 40 years ago. Networks of diagrams. Can okay. You, you can understand diagrams. Yeah, like okay. feedback yeah. loops. You can understand maps and feedback loops and uh, the, the, the quantum, you know what quantum mechanics is? Yeah, it's I have a reasonable idea. Vectors, vectors uh, X and Y and Z, and they end up pointing to a particular point where the, where the information is clustered. That then links to another set of clusters and another set and another set. That is the geometry of information, correct? Yeah, it's actually very interesting what you said because uh, if today they have like a, a predominant learning, a pre pre predominant model for how people learn, it's called constructivism. And it pretty much functions just like networks in a sense to make meaning of something, you need yes. to have presence of its related information in the network, otherwise okay. you can't quite work out the meaning of it. And right. So what, what Google did with Docker, we know that the internet will forget things, but eventually it forms a static relationship between the people that need a service, say pensioners and transport, between uh, people and health, between, uh, what was that? Something just turned off. Okay, that camera turned off, but I've still got two other cameras going, so that's fine. Yeah, so that's what I would say to Parliament is that we need to address the language of committees, the language of law, the language of uh, the media, and we need to dismantle all of the constructs that have been hijacking us for the last 4,000 years or so, and replace it with something which is new and modern and we know that this technology exists because Google is an example of that technology. Well, Bert, I would say that, um, look, I, I am a novice when it comes to say cybernetics and in, in, in terms of its near-term future uh, possibilities, but I can say that in many, many fields, the present economic system and its requirement for a profit out of everything generated um, has held back human progress in major way. Perhaps you may say medicine, where they will never develop a cure for any disease, especially if it's a really simple drug, because that will destroy profits, for example, of, of, of the cancer industry. I mean, let's say in uh, agriculture, where I'm, I, I'm an engineer, I do a little bit with robotics automation, and I could say confidently that there is 
easy feasibility for us to have, you know, 90% plus automated greenhouses in every other man's backyard that produce pesticide, herbicides, GMO free food that is, you know, so much healthier. Um, yeah, I agree. And you could extrapolate that to, you know, why are planes still flying on the jet engines when the jet engines were developed in the 50s? You know, surely this military industrial complex that sucked up more money for their propulsion systems, probably tens of times more money for their propulsion systems than the IT industry, which brought us the internet and the information age and probably propelled our civilization 30, 40 years in front. Ever did. Everything okay, Jim? Yes, I'm just looking up the name of the man who started the cybernetic revolution. Was that they were able to pinpoint a document in universal cyberspace or cybernetic uh, networks. And that had a set of coordinates. Those set of coordinates were the words used inside the documents formed like like fence posts along the way to find out where that document resides. All of the documents close to it uh, were fed back to you when your search query used terms that were similar. Right. Years and years and years ago, uh, Claude Shannon, he was the IBM engineer who uh, designed the mathematics of information, the, the, the quantification of information. Particularly, he was able to take words and convert them to numbers. And when you can convert numbers, words to numbers, you can convert documents to numbers. When you can convert documents to numbers, you end up pinpointing it in cyberspace. What Google have done is that they have rented out that uh, cyberspace and they've made money on advertising. It is the claim of, it's the claim of cyberneticians that the network of documents or the network of decisions which allow you to make inference, intuition, the mathematics of intuition allows for a complete replacement of the very simple arithmetic used in banking. As we know, in banking, there's two vectors involved with price. I give you some money and that puts a vector of plus money in your bank. I use a minus vector which takes money away from my bank. Now, with cybernetic, you end up with vectors going in every direction according to how many elements there are within the space of reasons. So you would basically, unlike you know the, the present economic system where you factor in what's my investment and what's my gain, that same transaction in the cybernetic space would include other externalities. Who else gains? Who loses? What the environmental prices and so on? Is, is that kind of what you're inferring here, or it does away with price? It does away with all the mechanisms of the current model. The current. When I say current, I'm talking about the current electricity model of finance, right. and it replaces it with a static electricity model of information. Where information is is uh, is held indefinitely. We have that on the internet solution in Chile, so that it can go out on your podcast, so that people can look him up. His name was Anthony Stafford Beer, as in free as in beer. Okay. Okay. Now, during the administration of Salvador in Allende in Chile in the early 1970s, Beer was closely involved with a visionary project. CyberSyn, S-Y-N. This ah. took cybernetic uh, theories into government. And obviously, we know what happened. The CIA... Pinochet a, kicked the end out with the help of the CIA, yep. Okay, so Stafford Beer was the unsung hero of, the, uh, of that revolution, and he died... So he was uh, a contemporary of Bucky Fuller, I presume, and uh, there were... He came out of the crew of mathematicians after the Second World War who had to dismantle the rationing system. Right. 
and bring in profit. So if you understand that during the Second World War, there was no profit to be made on anything. Ah. Right. And this is I have no idea. So you're, you're saying that, say, the... I mean, we all know that the arms manufacturers today make trillions of dollars on, yes. on the war. Then they did, everything Are was you telling me that at the Second World War, that was not the case because of... Or what is the rationing system and how... Well, it didn't have profit involved in it. So you're it saying that the manufacturers... Price, price wasn't involved. So they, like, let's say, I don't know, I am Northrop Grumman or I make tanks. Yeah, well, you were commandeered. <laughs> you were commandeered. They gave you yeah. the resources and yes. you made tanks and that's it. Yeah. That's it. And then after the Second World War, they had to gradually bring in price and profit and this is where the the, the the small denomination coins were very important some of the history i like your uh, obsolescence program by the way because it taught me a fair bit of stuff i didn't know about about lamp bulbs and stuff ah. after the second world war the small uh, halfpenny and farthing was used in england to uh, Look for theft at cash registers because if everything was rounded up to the like uh, 99 cents, that one penny that was given in change uh, was an indication as to how many sales were made. Oh. And the accountants would count up the pennies and they would look after the pounds. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. it was. So if you look into the 